Good morning to this Five Property Show. Now, when I did a wee intro the other day, I talked about how does a well, who wants more money to begin with? <laughs> Me. Who wants a better lifestyle? Me. You know what? That's how I thought as well. So this is the way I did it. But how does a guy that was homeless and unemployed at 18 year old end up retiring at 30 year old financially free? How is that possible? Somebody that was asked to leave school as well ended up retiring. 38 year old financially free and going on to major success. I learned from my peers. So we're going to discuss this as well as the buy to let market itself this morning and the growth and the yield involved in property and how property can set you free, not us, because it set me free already. You know, but I've done all the blueprint work and everybody else could learn from that. That's really what it's down to. So I've made all the mistakes before, and this is what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to bring on some seasoned people in the property world. You know, Richard Cook is a lettings director with Five Properties. Hi, Richard. How are you this morning? Morning, Jim. Great this morning. How are you? Absolutely fantastic. And we've got James Watson. Now, James is actually new to buy to let, but he's actually learning all the various different strategies that are available right now in the buy to let industry. How are you this morning, James? I'm good, thanks. How are you guys? Absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Guys, would it surprise you if I said that almost 80 people out of the top 100 rich list in the Sunday Times is involved in property in some shape or form? Wouldn't it surprise me? Not at all. And overall, one in six out of the whole rich list itself, I think it's about a thousand people, is actually involved in property in some way at all. Yeah, I think you, you, you always see these uh, these people in these rich lists always have some connection back to um, property investment, definitely. Yeah. I mean, the they hold any stock either, but sometimes they're just angel investors investing in other people's projects and getting a return that way. Absolutely. We're going to say a wee good morning to Mark. Good morning, Mark. How are you? Uh, guys, morning, we're open to questions from the forum as well. From anybody who wants to ask any questions, please feel free to ant, uh, answer, ask it. Um, we will be able to ask your question, answer your questions live, possibly. That could be an easy thing for us to do. Um, yeah, James, let's talk about your journey in the beginning. You know, where did you start and how did you get started in buy to let? Right, okay. So uh, previous, in my previous work life, I was an IT contractor. Um, through a succession of tax changes, IR35 been one of them. Um, those changes from running your own business to more or less being deemed an employee with no rights. So ended up having to take a permanent role. At the same time, uh, we were looking to move back to Burnt Island to be closer to the, my wife's uh, parents and kept the property that we had previously that we bought in 2004, I think it was around about £32,000. Done a bit of upgrade work uh, and rent that out today. Uh, pulling in £625 a month in rent. Uh, got revalued £115,000. Wow. And, so, and is was that the beginning for you then? Was that where it all started and you that, the penny started to drop? So that was the catalyst. So the, we moved into this property in a, quite a, quite an expensive part of Burnt Island. Uh, and we thought, right, well, if we're going to do this, we're going to have to try and supplement the income. So we used the asset that we had to pay for the current property that we're living in now, or at least partially. Perfect. That's a great idea. So so you took equity out of the existing property, yep. then put it into the market and rented it and 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 actually made effectively made money on the money, if that makes I sense. Eighty five thousand pounds yeah. out of the previous property and I used that to buy I think it was three last year. Wow. Okay. Uh, two of them are uh, rented out. One's in the process of getting refurbed at the moment. And uh, yeah, we're going to sort of snowball that. Uh, and one of the properties I bought uh, is now rented, obviously, through five properties. I was just going to say, uh, you've got a good agent looking after them. I've got a cracking <laughs> agent, to be absolutely honest. You know? I would hope so. I hope you didn't yep. come on and say they're rubbish. Yep. So, uh, <laughs> as I let you know in previous shows, uh, struggling to get tradesmen, obviously. It's a tricky time for tradesmen. But yeah. Landscape Gardener should be going in this week and hopefully get the revaluation done at the back end of that and pull that money out and suck it into something else. So how are you managing to do this? So you took eight to five thousand out and then yeah. you bought three properties. So how did you manage to buy three properties with eight to five thousand pounds? Because three properties isn't eight to five thousand pounds. Yeah, so uh, this is a thing. So 
uh, I looked at uh, trying to get some off-market properties or some properties that looked as though there was a bit of scope to add value. Um, the first one that we got was actually the one that we're, we're discussing just now. Uh, that was an executor sale. Mm -hmm. So it went through a, a solicitor's firm rather than listed on Zoopla. Uh, uh, right move. Right move not, yeah. Yeah. So uh, that one came in at 60000 all in with taxes and whatever else. So, you, you know, yourself and buy to let, 25% deposits, 15000 Yep. And they uh, put in about, around about £18,000 worth of work to it. Uh, and having looked over the historical comparables for the area, you know, within sort of half a mile over the last six months, properties of the same style and not even in the same condition. Mm -hmm. Changing hands for 105 to 110, 112,000. And I know of three such sales in the last sort of six months. So, uh, yeah, I always base it on the conservative side. So, we're maybe looking at about 100,000, but if any more than that, it's a bonus, obviously, and it allows me to get all money back out and plow it in the next project. Okay. So, you put 20,000 in about, you know, you were saying, and then you bought it for 60. So, you got it for 80 all in. So, what did you remortgage it? Uh, it hasn't been remortgaged yet. Again, we're waiting for the. the what last are you hoping mortgage. for? I'd be happy with a hundred thousand. Wow! Uh, but and and the mortgage works are doing eighty percent buy to let now. They are indeed, but uh, yeah, obviously there's a there's an interest uh, hit there. You know, you may you may get that eighty percent, but obviously the, you'll pay slightly higher on the the mortgage interest. Yep. What do you think you'll be paying mortgage interest wise? Probably about three point six or thereabouts. Um, I think. My previous ones through the mortgage work are sitting around about 3.4 at the moment. Yep. So anywhere between 3.4, 3.8, you know, I'd, I'd be happy with that. And then what do, you, what do you think you'll rent it for? So that particular property is renting at the moment for 550 a month. Okay. Uh, I've got one, another one in Kirkcaldy that's a flat. That's renting at the moment for 450 a month, but uh, it's because I know the tenant particularly well. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, we cut a, a bit of a deal. And uh, the one in uh, another one that we sort of purchased towards the tail end of last year that's now starting the refurb, I'm looking at around about sort of £500 for that one. It's a three bedroom. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, the the rents are pretty strong there. People are wanting to live next to family and so on. So yeah, there's, mm -hmm. there's good ties there. Absolutely. I, I mean, it makes absolute sense, doesn't it, to do that? You know, to the to to do the to do it that way, and 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 that and that process in terms of getting the money back out. Well, you know, so you're leveraging other people's money effectively. You're leveraging the bank's money. You know, so you're putting in your twenty five percent deposit or whatever else, and the rest is made up by the bank. That, yeah. You know. Well, let's have a, let's have a look at that right now then, and let's have a look at leveraging your income and how we do it. So here's right. the spreadsheet here. So effectively what you're saying is you're going to get a valuation of 100,000 up here. Yep. You're 25% in. We're assuming 3.6% 8%. And then we're, we're arrangement fee. We're probably about £1,000 for arrangement fee, aren't we? About there, 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 yeah. there, there, there. So, so there. And then 550 a month rent. So when you look at the numbers here on a, on a 12 months occupancy rate, assuming it's 12 months, your top line rent is 6, 6 And then your mortgage is 2.8. And then your gross profit is round about three eight. You're clearing three hundred and sixteen cash every month after the mortgage is paid. Your gross yield there is six point six percent. Now that is if you bought it for cash. Yeah. But look where your yield goes when you leverage it up with the mortgage, up to fifteen percent. So you leverage it up with the mortgage. Your gross yield now turns to a yield of fifteen percent. You've leveraged your money by nine percent in here, in yep. this week figure here. And therefore, and I assume 30% overhead is the top line rent just for anything, just for property management, just for minor repairs as you go out through the year, your insurance, um, all the things that you would have to do, landlord registration, everything like that, and gas certificates, electrical Boys, certificates. That sort of stuff. Yeah, so that's the 30% in. So basically, you're coming out with 4.6, which is a six, about a 7% net return on, on your deposit. And you're not actually doing anything for it, are you? But not, the key here happened. is... You've got no money in here because you have got your 75000 right back out, haven't you? Yeah. In here. So effectively, if you did it like that, you'd have a 6.7%. But in this scenario, you've got a infinite return. Yes. Because you've got absolutely no money in there anymore. Why did I not think of that? 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, of, that, of course, of course I did. <laughs> <laughs> and that's effectively on a basic scale how you do buy to let, isn't it? Uh, no, it's it's effectively out because because this now this is the key point here. I'm going to zoom in on this. <laughs> this is the only business that pays you to wait. You get paid rent every single month to wait for the capital appreciation over the next 15 to 20 years to make more money. This is the only business you're actually paid to wait. How great is that? Yeah, I was just going to say what you've done there, James, is just as a classic example of buy to let investment to create long term passive income. So how did you come about to do that? I mean, where did that all come from? Why? How did you come up with that, that, that whole process? Where did you get that from? How did you find out about it? Tell us more, James. So, like many people, it was by accident, really. Um, I had been looking at how we can uh, sort of increase a, a, a bit of money, uh, you know, in the event that for whatever reason I maybe became sick for a period of time and couldn't work or whatever. Um, and property was basically conduit to to uh, secure that, you know, that, that yeah. sort of future in case anything happened. At some point in the future, I wanted to do a bit of travelling and things because I obviously delayed that rather than going out and taking a gap year when I was younger and visiting the world and whatever else. Mm -hmm. um, I still want to visit places, but if I can do that and not have to rely on a, a nine to five income, then yeah. yeah. So I, th I think starting off, you really need to be clear about the why, why you want to do these things. Yeah. And, uh, do you for, think that's more yes. important then? Do you think the why is more important than the how? Because, I mean, you know, that's what I've always thought anyway. Well, I think you have to start somewhere and think, well, what, what, what am I want to do? Am I want to build a, a little nest egg? Do I want to just uh, supplement my income? Do I want it to replace my income altogether? Yeah. Uh, do I want it to be something that I can hand down to my children uh, without taking too much an IHT hit? So you have to think about all these sort of things mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. the beginning. And it helps you then form a strategy on how you're going to achieve it and how you're going to get there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so so for me personally, I, that, that's exactly the same reasons. as the why was more important for me than anything. Because if you don't have the why, you'll never do the how. You know, is that is that how you feel about it? Because uh, uh, you, you get up some mornings and you think, I oh, really can't be bothered. But is it is it the why that spurs you on to do it? Yes, definitely. Uh, as, as for, for me, uh, you know, I mean, I've got a limited amount of time that I can work in an employed job. And, uh, yeah. The one thing that money does buy you is time. Uh, rather than trading that time for money, you can make better use of the time and maybe potentially earn more money, but then you don't have to be there nine to five. You know, these things, once you systemize them, they can take care of themselves pretty much. I mean, that, that is a good point. It is, it is the current system you trade time for money. I'd mentioned the other day, you know, I, you know when, I, when I went to school, and, and I think they still do this, the, the, the pre-program you and they design you to work for someone else. You know, the whole system's geared up to do that. Um, and because of that, um, you, you just follow the pattern and you follow the pattern of behaviour. And then it's only sometimes, you know, I was lucky enough in my early 20s to actually come across systems and processes and people who were making exponential gains in other areas. And, and I started to lift what was called the, the, you know, the ceiling, the limit you think you've got and you're earning. I mean, classic example of your limit is what do you think you're worth right now? And a lot of people say, well, I'm only worth 16,000, 20,000 a year. They immediately tie it into a job. But they actually don't realise, there's a classic example here, Richard, if I was to give you one million pounds for your arm, would you do it? No. <laughs> no, if I was to give you six million to take your legs away, would you do it? No. No, you've instantly put a valuation at seven million and we've not even started yet. Yeah. So, so you're worth significantly more than you are, because, but we condition ourselves to, to say that we're only worth what somebody else is prepared to pay in, in their opinion. But really, that's what the job's worth. It's not what you're worth. Yeah. Yeah, you can take that a stage further. I mean, a lot of people will be educated to go to university, you know, end up in a lot of debt, particularly if you live in England, obviously. So you could be leaving a degree that everybody else has got and uh, 50, 60 thousand pounds worth of debt that you have to pay back and still end up on 
maybe a job that you didn't see yourself doing, you know, maybe flipping burgers or whatever, because yeah. everybody's got these degrees. You then go on to get a good job and, you know, you're taught to get a promotion and whatever else, but as you're steadily climbing that and getting more money and whatever else, so too do your liabilities and you're not thinking about assets to replace mm -hmm. or to pay for those liabilities. So effectively, you could be going out to work for nothing. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, you've hit the nail on the head. Richard will be, Richard will be quite depressed after the show. People <laughs> 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 like, what am I doing? I should be depressed. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll have your portfolio, Richard. The difference, so I enjoy my job. But it takes, it takes, a, it takes a discipline, doesn't it, really? I would say so, yeah. You have to really yeah, clear it. Yeah, it's a good to, yeah. It's a good to one to do without in order to have later on what other people can't have. I, well, I, think, I, mean, I think you hit the nail on the head a couple of months ago. Uh, we had a, a brief discussion and you talked about delayed uh, gratification. So I was yeah. looking at maybe a new car and he said, well, that's two houses. <laughs> Why? <laughs> So yeah, I'm making do with my 12 plate seat at the minute. So did that did that stop you buying your new car? <laughs> it actually spurred me to buy another house. Perfect. And that's how I used to think about it all the time. And I still do think about it like that. I effectively run in a car which I don't own. Uh, that's all I do. And and I don't have any desire to own another car because it's a wasting asset. The only luxury I have is a camper van. And, and everybody goes, that's quite sad. It's like, well, it's not really, because I'm building it for my children and their children and their children that aren't even born yet, effectively. So there's a legacy left as a result of what I've done before. I mean, I sat with somebody last night and actually extrapolated a pension where you put £144,000 in over 50 years, 2880 every year, and if it grew by... 5% every single year by putting 2,880 in and you got the government contribution. And this is for a child over 50 years. They could retire at 50, at 50 year old with about 800 to 900,000 pound in their bank at, at 50 year old in 50 years time, just by putting 2,880 pound in every year in a pension for a child if it grew at 5%. Now we took that one step further just to show how, how that came out. And we said at 10%, and that fund, with just the same amount of money, ended up being 4.6 million. And the compounding effect is the same effect we get in property as well, isn't it? It's the well, compounding. Compounding is a superpower, to be fair, yeah. you know. I think or whatever, or Avengers, but yeah, compounding is definitely like a superpower. Absolutely. Because when you think about the logic, of it, you've actually invested in that one property. Now you've got that property, it's worth a hundred thousand now. So a hundred thousand and you're getting four thousand six hundred out of it. So let's look at let's just jump on and I'll share that screen again so people understand what compounding wealth is. Um so we'll jump on here again and we'll look at this. Now, see, you are making four thousand six hundred in this scenario every single year. But what we people don't realize is you actually own a property worth £100,000. And we know in the last 10 years, property prices have gone up 46%. So this is what I talk about is literally you're paid to wait. Because if this went up the average price in the next 10 years, it went up the last 10 years, the 46%, you have effectively made another 46000 just for waiting on top of your £4,600 4, a year. That's right. And I think... Uh... You know, nationally, the, the your, your property price doubles virtually every sort of seven to ten years. Again, time. Yeah, I back. tend to. I err on the side of caution for everything, so I'm quite prudent about everything. So I look at property doubles every fifteen to twenty years, in terms of that. Um, and that then, that then, that's how all my strategy um, comes out because then I'm hedged against most things that can happen in the system, in the economy, or anything that I can't control. So if interest rates go up, I don't need to worry. If rents come down or get capped, because the government's talking about it now, I don't need to worry, because I'm not leveraged up as much as anybody else. And then if occupancy rates drop, because suddenly there's an influx of rental properties on the market, which is very doubtful. Um, um, <laughs> I know, you're, you're laughing as well. It's like the, the indicators that there's no way there's gonna, because we're not building enough houses anyway, and there's huge demand for houses, and there's not even enough houses selling just now to be able to do that. 
So, yep. you know, rental, the rental business is going to boom for, for all the years to come. So it doesn't matter what the government does and what they tinker about with, it will still continue to boom as a result. So where do you think the phrase, it's as safe as houses, comes from? <laughs> it's, it's exactly right. Your money is as safe as houses if it's in houses. A lot of people don't understand that mentality. And then when you get as well to the process of you take money out of your own house and a lot of people go, oh, my God, I'm going to take money out of my own house to invest in property. But you're actually putting in another asset. It's just like another property. So if your house is going up in value, uh, the other property is going up in value as well. So you're not actually doing anything but actually re-diverting existing resources that you're not making money on and you're actually making money on that money. Exactly, and I haven't done that yeah. yet with, with the current property that I'm in. I could actually leverage another £120,000 now uh, because it's went up about 50000 since we bought it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. It's, 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 it's amazing. And a lot of people don't understand as well. What we don't understand is the classic example is this is what business does every single day. It's not anything unique. This is how business runs. This is how all your empires run as well. They take the bank's money and leverage that up and make more money on that. Because if they can borrow at the bank at 3% and they can make a 25% return on capital, they're making a 22% differential on every pound at the borrow from the bank. The worry there is, as I said, is if interest rates start to go up. But that's where if you're hedged and you've planned for it, interest rates are not going to catch up with that because you're making so much in terms of that. So you, you could you could plan it so you can you can uh, alleviate your position where you can make it quite comfortable for yourself, where you never need to worry. You can literally go to your bed every single night and never need to worry again about money. I, I think as an industry, there's a built-in uh, mitigation anyway because, you know, once you refinance, you need to leave 25% in the property anyway. Well, property prices generally don't fall as much as 25 percent even in the hard times well and the credit crunch the the, the drop between 15 and 19 percent yeah. and that was it so so even the credit crunch never affected that drop in equity which everybody had in at the time so everybody was more or less okay it was very few people that went to the wall except everybody it was leveraged right up to the hill you know and do we're, we're really trying to push it as much as possible uh, and that's why they went to the wall, because they leveraged themselves up to the hill. They bought properties in the wrong areas. They brought them at too high prices. The numbers did not work. And yet today, if you follow the blueprint and the pattern that we put down today, it's a done deal. I mean, this this example that I showed you there, when I go, when I go back to that and in and, and, and that process, I mean, effectively, that's all we're doing. We're just, follow, we're just following a blueprint. Well, that's my emails. <laughs> in the wrong screen. Shared the wrong screen. Anyway, we're effectively got a blueprint about where we are and what we're doing and how we're doing it and the whole process. Um, and and if I could share that, if I could get onto that, there it is there. So effectively, what we're doing here is we're working out because we, we we know when you buy a property for the first time. Let's take for example here, if you can see all that. Your four percent ADS is definitely there. Um, your twenty five percent deposit is definitely there. Your 3.68% is definitely there. Now, that's a limited company rate, and that's a five-year fixed rate loan with the Mortgage Works just now. Now, if you get that in your personal name, I was looking at the Mortgage Works in personal name, you can get that for around about 1.5%. So I'm really... Yeah, I'm, one, one, I'm really... Perfect. Okay. So if you can get that in your own name, then that's what you do. If you're only wanting one property, buy it in your own name and you'll make money out of it and you'll get a lower interest rate. But we, again, I've got that hedged in where it's a higher interest rate than usual. The mortgage arrangement fees are done deal as well. We know what the rental level is going to be already. And then we know what our, what our tolerance is in terms of the green sections here, which is all the, all the ones we want to do. So all you need to do here is factor in what purchase price you want to pay for a property in order for your numbers to come out right. If you want cash flow over 400 quid every single month after the mortgage is paid, then you you have to buy it at 60,000 in that scenario. If you want 350 at minimum, then you could possibly go up to a 70,000 purchase price. There you go, say 386. You could probably go up to an 80,000 purchase price at 363. And you probably go at 85, 
65 one there you go so eighty-five thousand is your tolerance and your purchase price to get that rent so you can go buy a property at that and that's where the numbers will come out over the next five years if you rent for that level and you keep it 12 months occupied so yeah. it's, it's a done deal and then you're leveraging yourself up from the button so you've got a 7.8 percent gross yield here and then you're leveraging that money with the bank money instead it becomes a 20 percent yield on that same money because you've now leveraged the money with borrowing from the bank. So you're up 12% immediately to cover your overheads, which are here. And then the total money you've got in, in this scenario is 26,650, which is your ADS plus the deposit, plus your legals and a little minor, like maybe EICR and smoke detectors in there as well with the 2000 that we've got there. So that's the 26,650. So if that's your tolerance, that determines your purchase price. Is that effectively how you do it, James? Yeah, it's probably similar. Um, you have to take all these sort of factors into account and so on. And like, like you say, I sort of leave sort of ten percent set aside for things like mm -hmm. well, ten percent for voids and ten percent for maintenance. Um, yeah, pretty much similar. Yeah, let's come on to rentals then, Richard. I mean, how confident are we are when we talk about these numbers that rental levels are, are at that level in Fife? Well, extremely confident, especially in the market just now. Uh, obviously, as James commented on earlier, rental prices are at a really good level just now. And um, because of the increased demand as well, we're even pushing them up further um, off market. Um, because obviously, yeah. if we've put a property on at a certain price, we've got, we're inundated with people. And then we, we are then able to negotiate a slightly higher price off the market with the people that are interested. So we're, we're achieving record uh, rental uh, prices at the moment for property. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, let's let's look at some of these prices then. Let's look, yeah. let's look across the board. I'll, I'll quickly jump on and see if I can share my screen for Zoopla. Um, so Zoopla has got some properties on just now. Um, see if I can get my Chrome tab. Can we see that just now? Just, it's just loading. Uh, yeah, we're on there. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let's look at Zoopla. Let's scroll through this. So look at this. I mean, you know, one bedroom flat in uh, Kirkcaldy for a uh, 420. 650 okay. for a uh, Resize, 550 yeah. for Woodley Grove and Glenrothes, 550 for Ravens Craig, 450 for a one bed in Cooper, um, one bed, 350 Wells of the Road in Methyl. So, I mean, one bedroom's ranging from what, 350 to 450, Richard, you reckon? Yeah, I mean, that interest, interestingly, the, the first one at Balsas in the Road, we've actually got downstairs next door. Um, yeah. And we rent that, and obviously the tenant's been in there quite a while, and I think it's 375 or whatever, so, but that's yeah. a few years ago, so look at the difference mm -hmm. now, uh, yeah. and they'll, they'll be fairly similar, those, those properties, so you're up at 420 now. Yeah. The, Wood, the Woodley Grove one, that was sold just recently, there was a, pro, uh, it was a portfolio of two properties, yep. sold for 77,000. Wow, they were selling 100,000, yeah. were they no? They were at one point, it was old Thomas yeah. Up area. When there were new builds, when there were new builds, I remember they sold for a hundred thousand. So seventy-seven thousand is a good price for that. Yeah, that's eh? that's growth, yeah. So when you look at the numbers on that on seventy-seven thousand, seventy-seven, and then type in five fifty, there's where you are in terms of your numbers. Let's quickly jump onto that one and jump onto there and share the screen. I'll remove this one. Didn't want to Sorry. remove anybody else. Sorry, John, I'm giving you a lot of work to do. Oh, no, no. Yeah. Uh, by all means, keep asking, because this is this is key for people to understand. Can you see that okay? Yeah. So 77,000 in, your 4% stamp duty, your 25% down. Well, again, we're assuming limited company, five-year fixed rate deal. Your 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 mortgage, uh, your arrangement fees round about, it's a £1,000. So I'll just put that 1.75 um, to get that to the £1,000. Your 550 rent, your 369 after the mortgage is paid, you've leveraged up from an 8.6% cash gross yield to a 23 with the bank's money. Your overhead's built in there. You've got a 10% net return. And you're actually no doing anything for this. This is passive income. You've got 24000 left in that deal. And over a 10-year period, at a 2% capital appreciation, combined with the 10 years profit and the 2% every year for, for 10 years, you've made a 164% return on your initial equity in of 24,000. And all you've got to do is take care of the compliance, smoke detectors, EICR. That's a really good example. And I think the, the My question is, is, why on earth is everybody else not doing this? I think yeah, it's about to do this. Do you think it's fear? 
some people I speak to do have a lot of uh, apprehension and things about just obviously going ahead with it. I, I like you say, fear. Fear is a big factor, and obviously yeah. when when it comes to dealing with uh, their their money and how they're going to invest it, they they are a bit reluctant. But when you when you look at it um, methodically and put it in perspective with that ready reckoner, I think that's brilliant. It demonstrates that as a numbers game, and if, as long as you've got the numbers right and you factor in these things like additional costs, like fees for management and EICRs and things, if it all works out, it'll it'll be a, it's, a, it's a good investment. Yeah. So so, um, when we come back to fear, I mean, if, if it, it's like what I said before, though. When you think about the logic of this, if you're taking money from your existing stuff, you're not losing it. You're actually investing it in property. It's still mm. there. Yeah. It's still there. And your exit strategy, here's a classic one. Now, I'll, I'll, you know, I've got to mention Elaine. Elaine has a very nervous about this. Elaine doesn't understand it, my wife. She completely does not understand this at all and how it works. Mm. But she doesn't realize that, um, for example, my loan to value currently just now is 25%. So, like, you know, I'm talking about 25% is is actually the the borrowing I've got on what I've got, so I could have my assets drop by seventy five percent in value, and I could still walk away clean. Uh-huh. How, how how is that risky? Yeah, that, that's a good safeguard. <laughs> Answers I mean... on a postcard. It's like how is that risky? The, <laughs> the credit wife... card should only drop twenty percent, and it's like I've got seventy five percent leeway. My wife's yeah. exactly the same. She's got a pot of money there, and she wanted me to prove concept before she decided to commit any money. <laughs> I think that's good that people are uh, doubtful or, or have that fear to to have somebody explain to them and demonstrate through example um, and success of their own. It's quite good to reassure people and show them that this is how it's done and that's that's the right way to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's look at uh, let's look at local housing allowance rates. Uh, see if I can actually get onto this because this is a classic example about what happens and where it happens. Now this is just now. Here's Fife. Um, so let's let me share this other screen um, quickly here. If I can just jump on here and we'll look at look at because this is key. Because what happens is everybody's got this nervousness about the government. So the government is going to clamp down on this and they're going to put caps on rents. Okay, so this is the key here to understand how this will affect you as a buy to let landlord. Okay, Uh, will you actually lose out as a result of it? Now, here's the key if I share this one for you and I'll let you see. Uh, So, this is the local housing allowance rates. Can you see that? Okay, yeah. So, see that's how shared that's a studio flat, that's our bed set rate. There's a one bedroom rate, a two bedroom rate, a three bedroom rate, a four bedroom rate. Now, these are the percentages from last year to run to for the 20 to 21. They've actually gone up recently, right? Right. But this is me erring on the side of caution. Now, this is what the government sets as the percentage quartile, they call it, as in what they would pay as a result of housing benefit to people that need support and their accommodation. So we just jump down to Fife, for example, and we'll look at Fife. Now, there's the bed set rate at 70.19. So we'll calculate 70.19. 70.19 multiplied by it's 52 weeks in the year divided by 12 is 304 pounds a month for a bed set that's one bedroom in a house um if we look at the one bedroom rate which is 100 uh, which is 86 30 86.3 times 52 which is again the, f- the 52 weeks because that's a weekly rate divided by the 12 that comes to around 374 pounds per month the government will pay towards a one bedroom mm-hmm. property 109 times 32 times 52 divided by 12 comes to 473 pounds they will pay for a two bedroom regardless right across five so 473 is the minimum you would get and 132.23 multiplied by 52 divided by 12 for a three bedroom allowance it would be 573 pounds now can i go back to saying richard you said to me a three-bedroom allowance was how much? Five fifty, wasn't it? Yeah, well, well, to be fair, you're probably closer to the six hundred just now. So three-bedroom allowance, so three-bedroom we were taking to account is five fifty. That's how I do my numbers, and yet the yeah. government paying five seven three. So when the government brings a cap in on these rents, do you think I really need to worry? No, no, <laughs> and that's the point. So people do not understand at the fact that even the government's bringing caps and rents. That's fine, but they will not cap it below what they're saying is the local housing allowance rate for even their housing benefit or universal credit tenants. 
They, they can't do that, or then they would have to then cut that all back as well. It's practically impossible that that will ever happen. What they're yeah. talking about is the extortionate landlords that will charge for a three-bedroom something like 950 to £1,000. pounds. And people are actually having to pay that, and they will pay it. And the government's saying, well, that's ridiculous for that type of property. Surely someone could live within their means in a better standard, a better lower value property with a better return, and, and that will work out perfectly as well. So that's where we, are, we never need to worry. That's the key here. You need to be... You need to understand that process and understand all the dynamics that are involved in that. I mean, what's your thoughts on that, Richard? Yeah, I think I've got. I've had a, a few conversations recently about rental caps and, and the worry that they're going to be obviously implemented. And I think that, like you just explained there, it is more uh, for uh, landlords and things that are setting the bar too high with maybe um, excessively high rental amounts. I think as long as you're uh, keeping it within how the market di dictates in the area, and of course, obviously, if they did cap uh, rental prices, they're not going to go lower than what the LHA is. And the LHA is more than comfortable enough to uh, generate a, a reasonable yeah. income on these uh, properties at this level. I think, so it I think it puts pressure on owners in, in places like uh, St Andrews, for example. Yeah. That's going to be really tricky. How do you judge, how, how do you work that out? Because uh, yeah. higher rental prices. Extremely higher rental prices. <laughs> Exactly. So, so that might be that might be a concern for people with higher value properties. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because because it's the old scenario, as I showed you in these numbers, as you've got to realise and understand the numbers in order to get the right return. But the key here is is it's the right return, not to make tons of money for yourself. It's to actually have, and you're nodding your head. You can what's coming next, James. It's like it's to actually be able to afford to actually keep the property in, in proper condition and look after the tenant. After all. You know yourself, James and Richard, is we've got a duty of care as landlords to look after the person that we are housing. Yeah. The well, last thing we want to do is put tenants in what could traditionally be described as slum tenancies. Yeah. Um, and because we've got that sort of dual aspect where we're looking at obviously rental and yields and demands and so on, we've also got the regulation that follows the back of it. We have, there will be issues as down south that. You know, once they bring these caps in, if they do bring caps in down south, then it may potentially have landlords thinking, well, I'm not going to invest as much money into this property. And, and you may get some slum landlords uh, operating because they that, don't have the regulation. That's, 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 what, that's what it's going to open up to, isn't it? It's going to make it worse. Slum landlords are going to appear because they're not going to be able to afford to actually put enough money in to look after the property so that'll what cause worse plus the fact it'll let a lot of people exit because they'll no longer want to do it fair enough it'll release a lot of houses for people wanting to buy them but what about the people that only can only rent they have no other choice they have no other choice and the government's not building enough houses to accommodate these people in affordable and social housing yeah. so you can't afford as a government and i'm going to say this to kevin stewart quite openly kevin and uh, you can't afford to upset the private landlords by changing and tinkering with the legislation because this is going to cause a catastrophic effect on the homelessness, on the people in dire need that you can't actually house yourself as a government. That's really what it comes down to. Well, we've, we've been from the gap, you know. I mean, at the end yeah. of the day, we, we do look at the, the, the figures and stuff like that, but we are from the gap that, you know, through inadequate number of houses getting built, yeah, and uh, obviously the sell-off in the eighties, the well, late eighties, early nineties of property that was local housing stock. Then it's a, a problem that's been created not through us, but we're trying to fill that gap. Yeah, perfect. We'll take a couple of comments here. This is James Forrest. He's actually not. I think it's Streamyard thing. So James Forrest says, "Nice work, James." So you'll probably know James Forrest, uh, uh, James. Uh, an interesting comment from Alisa. Um, people are by nature both risk adverse and underconfident. I would uh, I would say or go into further say Alicia that people are by nature like that because they're programmed like that by the system that actually brings them up and educates them. Is that a fair comment, James? I would say so. Yeah. Yeah. So if everyone had someone like Jim telling them and James and Richard that their aspirations and objectives are correct, and that as if they are as calculated correctly, there'd be very little risk. 
and the damages the property and potential the new legislation that means. Um, sorry, she's, I'm reading. <laughs> I went on to read something else there. <laughs> and if you look at a very real risk, then more people would invest in property. That's exactly right, Alicia. Sadly, there are not enough encouraging gyms to go around. Absolutely. Now, what I would say is just beware because not everybody is talking the truth. There is, yeah. I, I talk about all the time, there's so many charlatans out there actually proposing to actually say that they know exactly what to do in proper investment. But effectively, when you look behind them and see what they've achieved so far, they've actually achieved very little. You know, um, and want, for want a better phrase, I always say it's like they've not even got a pot to piss in. <laughs> I think yeah. that's definitely value in uh, surrounding yourself with people that are doing it. But uh, yeah, you have to be you have to look a bit deeper sometimes to see what people are actually doing and how they're doing it but yeah certainly a network of individuals that have done it it's yeah invaluable. my advice my advice for everyone to look for someone is it's it's in property if you think you should be following them and you're on board with them please find out the limited company name so if the limited company and this is a classic so you know i could i could do it right now let's let's jump on a company's house um, so company's house. Yeah, I was just going to say that. I think it's important, and I've seen it a lot over the years. If you're going to, if you're going to go down this route of buy to let investment, and you're looking for uh, mentors and people to kind of guide you in things, it's always important to check how successful they've been and and, and their yep. track record, which you're about to just demonstrate just now, Jim. Absolutely. Let's share company's house, and I'll show you how to do this. I'll just do this for myself. Everybody will be going on looking at my company now. <laughs> <laughs> There's only one of my companies, by the way. Um, so let's look at Company's House. So you jump onto Company's House. Everybody see that okay? Yeah. Yep. So Company's House, gov.uk, find company information. You can quickly jump on. Now, there's no surprise here. My company is called Parker Housing Limited. Here we go. Parker Housing Limited. Caledonian House. Quickly look on there. The people, you'll know straight away. Here I am, James Parker, my wife. Uh, filing history, you can immediately go unabridged accounts. There you go, unabridged accounts, and there's my accounts for the end year ending December 2019. Yeah. Public record for all to see. And that's the key here. So you can go into a company's house and find out anything you want about these people. You can also find out where these people are if they're involved in other companies. Because if you click on their name, it actually tells you if they've got any other companies. So nine other appointments. So I have Tigger and Timmy Limited. That's my cat. <laughs> <laughs> I have Buddy yeah. and Buster Limited. There's the surprise. That's my cat. <laughs> I have Five Properties Limited. There's, <laughs> but that's not a cat. <laughs> um, so there's all the different ones. So that's how you can check somebody's background quite easily. So I would encourage everybody to do that all the time, every time as a result, because then you'll know exactly what they've got and who they are and what they can afford. That's the key here. Go you can on. Take that stage further as well, Jim. Yep. Sorry to interrupt, but you can also check charge notices to see that they are involved in property and how many they've got. Yeah, that's a key here as well. On the same records, you're absolutely right. If you look further down that list, you'll actually see charge notices, and then it'll, you'll be able to click on these charge notices. It will tell you if it's a bank, who the bank is, or who the financer is, but it will tell you as well what it, what the charge notice is on. In other words, what property it is they've got as a result and then you'll know they've actually been actively buying property because i tell you what there's a lot of people out there just now telling us straight away that they have they've made it big they look the part they've got the bmw it's leased for 350 pounds a month they've got the fancy house the flashy house it's mortgaged up to the hilt for 600 pounds a month they're paying through their nose for all these things they're showing everybody on instagram and the, and, the, and, and the news and everything like that and showing everybody on facebook look what i've got look at my flashy lifestyle but when you look behind it on company's house they don't have a pot to piss in yeah I looked, I looked i looked at one of these without naming names i looked at one of these uh inspirational coaches i guess he calls himself and uh, when i looked into it Claimed it was worth 60 million in property. And well, actually, last year his turnover was something like two and a half million based on property courses that he had sold. And uh, in terms of property, I think I think it had something like four and a half million pounds worth of property that were charged most. 
Yeah. His explanation for that was, oh, but I hold a lot in my properties in personal name. But that's that's crazy at that level. That's crazy to have them in personal name. Yeah. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we were taught that in the beginning because we didn't have all the legislation we've got now, so that's the same for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like it's, it's murder. It's like well, in order to transfer it, we'll have to sell them to a limited company. Then it's another four percent charge for your own property. So you have to weigh up whether that's worth it actually selling it for the benefits of having it in a limited company, and not having it in a limited company. And there's a there's a fine balance there somewhere. And I'm it's able if it's easy because I, I mean I, again I come back to saying you know for people out there. Um, I've done it all. I've 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 gone to the ends of the earth. I've actually taken myself to the brink of destruction several times up here in order to establish a proper blueprint to show people the path and the journey in a quick process in order to get that. Now, I don't mean quick as in you're going to be a millionaire next year. What I mean for quick for me is 10 to 20 years. It's not it's not 5 years time and you're going to be minted. And and if that happens for you then congratulations. But I always look on the principle that easy come, easy go. Um, it's a house of cards sometimes, excuse the pun, and effectively that's what some people build. And that's why when anything happens, it's quite volatile to the economy or the sector that they can't control, they've lost everything. Well, that's it. All it needs is a subtle tweak in regulations, and that's it. <laughs> You're opening yourself up potentially to that same situation. Yeah. It's quite an interesting comment Alicia says as well. I suspect another reason that people don't actually invest in rental property is the fear of the nightmare tenant. You know, um, who doesn't pay the rent and the damages of the property and potentially new legislation that means you can't evict a tenant. Richard, do you want to elaborate that on that? I was just going to say, and that, that is a big uh, fear for a lot of people. And I think that then all reverts back to having the right people in place to find you the correct tenant and manage it properly, reference them up properly. Um, and obviously the new um, restrictions with evictions and things has been an issue and has been at the forefront of a lot of landlords' uh, minds. But I think as well, if you've got the right tenants in place and you manage that situation properly, it's not it's not something to be scared of. It's something to uh, have managed correctly. Yeah, this is this is where I come back to saying, though, um, it's about spreading your risk as well. Um, so I'll, I'll just jump back on the spreadsheet and I'll show you an example of what I mean by that. Um, here's a classic example. Um, just jump into here. Here's a classic St Andrews property. Richard, two hundred thirty thousand for a two bedroom that you would buy in St Andrews, a two bedroom flat, ex local authority. How much would you get in rent for that? Eleven hundred, twelve hundred. So we'll, we'll just turn the side off optimism 1200 okay so then you're coming out with this um uh, in terms of the buy to let in terms of your strategy that uh, that's actually a lot lower because the arrangement fee is only a thousand pound so point zero zero five. yeah you're probably around point zero 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 seven so you're probably point point zero zero six see how i'm playing with the numbers there just yeah. to get that to work out exactly how I want it. So this is the beauty of using this. Um, so you're 600 cash after that's paid. You've got 30%. You're leveraging your position from 6 to 14 We're using the bank's money. You're 10,000 out. But this is the classic example that we talked about. You've got all your eggs in one basket. This yeah. is why I say to people, there's 6 to 8,700 in there. Right? So just look at that figure, 6 to 8. So almost 70,000 pounds with that one property. So this is where you get the nightmare tenant. And then, then it all goes pear-shaped. But what happens if you then take that down to the other side of the equation and you buy 70,000? And now, what would a 70,000 property rent at, Richard, roughly? Uh, 500 of a two-bedroom. Five, five, 500. Well, we're on the side of caution, 500. Yeah. Okay, so 70,000 property. But remember, here, you've got 22 in there now for a 70,000 property. So you can get three of them, can't you? Three, yeah. Ah, so you're up at about 70,000 again. Okay. So you're actually earning more. So it was 10,000 before, now you've got 12,000. How worried do you, how can you be if you've got three properties running and your nightmare tenant comes along and one property goes down as a result when you've got three properties running? You're not going to be that worried. You're not going to be worried as in the one property you had at 230,000. And that's the key here about spreading your risk, about buying properties at the appropriate level to leverage your income, to le to minimise your risk involved as well. So if one goes down, the rest are okay. If one of them doesn't rent for six months, you've got two of them renting all the time, which mm -hmm. pays for the one that doesn't rent for the six months. So that's where you leverage your income. Now, in this scenario, see here, we've got this here at 164% return on the same money. 
over 10 years. And yet, if we change it back, that 164% there to the 1,200 here comes becomes, look, 121% on the same money. Yeah. Now, do we understand the concept of getting the numbers right in the beginning? The understanding, the dynamics. This is not about, I love that property. This is a numbers game at heart, at the core values of this. This is all about, this is what I can borrow at it for the five-year fix. That's minimized risk because it's five-year fixed. It's going to cost me 4% EDS because I've got to buy this. I'm not paying extra stamp duty over and above the 4% additional dwelling supplement because it's a lower value property. It's below the 140,000 threshold. I also know where my rental level is going to be because I've got a, a letting agent on board that knows exactly what it is. I know the local housing allowance as well. So if that person falls on hard times, I know how much they'll get towards their rent. So I could minimize that position as well. If anything happens to that person's job, I know where I stand risk-wise because I just play the numbers and work out where it works at that. And then if my property goes empty for, for example, for half of the year, do I need to be worried? Possibly not. So this is all why it comes core in its value down to a numbers game. Richard, what's your thoughts? Yeah, definitely. I think if you if you stick to the methodical thinking with the numbers and make sure they, they calculate out and treat it as a business and not get too emotionally involved, like, oh, I like this property and not think about the numbers side and purchase it as a vital investment, it's not, not going to work out the way you expected. Mm -hmm. James, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, as Richard says, that's the first thing that uh, the first mistake that potential investors tend to make is uh, get emotionally attached to a property and saying, "No, oh, this is going to be a good buy," and then find out later stage that potentially it's not been a good buy because they haven't run the numbers properly. Yeah. yeah, it's also the fact when you look at the thing. I mean, for me, it just blows my mind. This, I really can't stop going back to this, where you could take an eight point six percent gross yield in this scenario and actually leverage it through the bank and actually end up turning that into a 23% gross yield with a mortgage. I mean, how great is that? <laughs> yeah, I think when people when we just, people discuss yields and things, they need to be aware that, obviously, like you say, it's a, that's based on a cash purchase, whereas if you're doing it with a mortgage, it's different. Aye, it leverages your position straight away because you've got less money in, but you're actually making money on the money to make that money, and you're leveraging yourself 15% more than what you would pay doing it for cash. Yeah. It makes absolute sense then in the scenario to actually do it with someone else's money. Mm -hmm. I call it what I call is opium, OPM, <laughs> other people's money. Yeah. <laughs> not the real opium, by the way. So we're no, we're no, we're no, we're no promoting that. <laughs> so Alicia actually says here. Um, so. You're suggesting you're better buying three properties, perhaps in cheaper areas, rather than an expensive one in a dearer area, and spreading the list, the risk, and your return. Definitely. You hit the nail on the head, Alicia. This makes absolute sense. Now, when we talk about cheaper properties, we are not talking about rundown properties. No, we are talking about properties in areas which are higher, are higher demand for a, a, a less expensive property. So I call it less expensive because cheaper implies it's less quality. Now, Richard, you've seen the quality I've done and I know the yep. quality James done. I, I'm just doing two refurbs now and the refurbs are costing me almost between 12 and 15,000 yeah. pounds. And I'm going to get probably around about a 500 to 550 return in, in yeah. terms of the rent level for them. And that's cheaper quality properties, but they're mint condition. Right. They're, in they're good brand new kitchens. They're, 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 they're the bespoke kitchens with the eye level ovens and yep. the, the hob and the extra chimney style extractor, gloss white, black ebony worktops, and all pristine. And bathrooms with proper wet wall, white, beautiful bathroom suites, shower over the baths, chrome fittings, all new heating systems, new radiators, carpeted all the way throughout, the typical grey, sort of whisper grey decoration and the white skittings and facings. I mean, for me, it's magnolia all the time, by the way. But I'm going, <laughs> I'm going with the whisper grey. I've, I've, I've come up with the times. Uh, <laughs> but we'll be talking about whisper grey in years to come, like we're talking about magnolia just now. Um, and and I'm, that's I'm, I'm, the, that is the blueprint to rent every single time because that's how you keep a 12 months. 100% occupancy rate. 
That's how you get a tenant to look after your property because you attract the right quality of tenant in the first place because you're providing them with the right quality accommodation. And forced a bit of capital appreciation at the bargain to get your money out. That's exactly it, James, as well. You're getting the win-win situation. You're also getting your capital appreciation because you've added significant value to that. So when if you want to, you can remortgage that and possibly pull all your money back out. And the bank is completely financing this property for an infinite return. How many people get an infinite return on their money in the bank just now? None. Everyone's getting zero return, if anything. And it'll come to the point where you might actually, well, you're actually losing money because inflation's eating into that as well. Um, so this is why we go back to the phrase, your money is as safe as houses. Yeah. It always will be. Houses have gone up on average in Fife 209% since the year 2000. In the last 20 years, 209%. That means a house has tripled in value. It's added on 209% to the existing value. It's gone up three times to its, uh, its new value. That's on average. Could you imagine if you've cherry-picked the right houses? Some of mine have gone up four, by the way. I had one that went up five. It's like it's remarkable. You are literally paid to wait and buy to let. How fantastic is that? When have you ever been paid to wait? Final thoughts on this, James. You're going to run out and buy more property. I'm <laughs> <laughs> going to try and uh, take the clasp off my wife's purse and buy more properties. <laughs> yeah, what about yourself, Richard? Yeah, I just I think, obviously, as we demonstrated this morning, vitally investment is quite lucrative if it's done correctly. And I think it's it's important to speak to, if you're yeah. starting out on that journey or you're, or you're looking to build on your portfolio through the journey, speak to the right people and, and get the right advice. Every single person uh, 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 asks me, I always do a one-to-one -one with them. I'm more than yeah. happy to do a one-to-one. -one. I run through their scenario and their circumstances. Recently, we had someone that actually didn't have, didn't realise they had actually money lying about it that could actually invest in property. He had no idea that the value of existing property because he didn't understand the dynamics of how it worked. He had yeah. no idea that he had, he had potentially another £30,000 he could release, and that would potentially allow him to buy two properties at, at, at you know, £60,000 each, £60,000 each. But remember as well, the key here is, is getting the numbers right. That's all it comes down to. Yeah. And on that note, guys, that's an hour already. That's amazing, eh? I know. I know, but it's a really good topic. We could have went on a wee bit further, I think. We had time. So can I just finish off by saying, how do you think an 18-year-old guy that was unemployed and homeless retired at 38-year-old 20 years later? It's the exact blueprint I've talked about just now. It's yeah. all the everything's been done already. I have made all the mistakes that you don't need to make. <laughs> <laughs> this is a turnkey situation. It's, uh, that's what you do. 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 And I'm more than happy to sit down with anybody. If you've got questions and you watch it after this, guys, please feel free to message us direct. More than happy to do a one-to-one -one with you. Just run through your circumstances. You don't understand what you don't understand, and you don't know what you don't know. You'd be amazed at what you've got lying about that you could actually leverage in order to make you more money. I, in the beginning, had 100% funding from the bank because I used my endowment policies as a security. And I was making money on my endowment policies as well as making money on the 100% funding I got as well. So I was making money on the money, and then I was making money on that money. <laughs> Triple times with the same money. That's how you retire. Yeah. Financially free. And that's it, guys. Thank you very much for coming on the show. James, no it's been a pleasure. Uh, uh, you know, this is, it's been a fabulous uh, time having you on the show. Yeah, thanks, Richard, you. it's been brilliant. You've you. fantastic as well. And thanks, everybody yeah. else, for watching. And that's us for the Five Property Show until next Saturday morning at uh, 9.30. Bye-bye for now, guys. Thanks, Jim. Bye. Bye.